Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to each one gathered here today or joining us on live stream on this Easter Sunday, whether you're special guests or extended family members, friends or regular attenders. It's great to be together. Today we celebrate new life the hope that we have through our faith in Jesus who is alive. This is the Lord's doing. Thanks be to God. Our Lenten theme this year has been Lent in Plain Sight, adapted from Jill Duffield's book, Lent in Plain Sight, a devotional through 10 objects. Each week during the season of Lent, we focused on an everyday object that you can see up here on the table and considered God's presence and desire to be in relationship with us. We were reminded that when we saw the objects during the week, to remember to see God in everything, in all things, and in all creation. This week, we're focusing on stones. Please join me now in the responsive call to worship. Open our ears to hear your word. Open our eyes to see your presence. Open our arms to the embrace of Open our minds to the beauty of truth. Open our hearts to the joy of new life. Enable us to see God everywhere, in all things, all creation, in Lent and in every day. Enable us to see Lent in plain sight, in everyday objects, even in stones. Let us pray. Giver of new life, we come this morning with our alleluias, our flowers, our songs. We come to worship in beauty and in truth because we have faith that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. We come to worship because we have hope that the resurrection will enter into each of our lives and transform us. Receive now our offerings of prayer and praise. In the strong name of our risen Christ, we pray. Amen. Our first hymn, Lo in the Grave He Lay, number 333. And please rise in body or in spirit.
Christ the Lord is risen today. We will share responsively our words of confession and assurance after signing the words that we've been signing during the season of Lent. Christ, have mercy. Let the rain come and wash away the ancient grudges, the bitter hatreds held and nurtured over generations, let the rain wash away the memory of the hurt, the neglect. Then let the sun come out and fill the sky with rainbows. Let the warmth of the sun heal us 
wherever we are broken. Let it burn away the fog so that we can see each other clearly, so that we can see beyond labels, beyond accents, gender or skin color. Let the warmth and brightness of the sun melt our selfishness so that we can share joys and feel the sorrows of our neighbors. And let the light of the sun be so strong that we will see all people as our neighbors. Let the earth, nourished by rain, bring forth flowers to surround us with beauty, and let the mountains teach our hearts to reach upward to heaven. Christ, have mercy. Amen. I will now be reading Luke 24, 1 to 11. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, the women went to the tomb, bringing the fragrant spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they didn't find the body of Lord Jesus. They didn't know what to make of this. Suddenly, Two men were standing beside them in gleaming bright clothing. The women were frightened and bowed their faces towards the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here. He has been raised. Remember what he told you while he was in Galilee. The human one must be handed over to the sinners, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. When they returned from the tomb, they reported the things to the eleven and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other woman with them who told these things to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words struck them as impossible nonsense. Can we hear me? Yeah, okay, it's children's time. Things haven't gone as planned today, but that's okay. Come on up, everybody. You know what, that has nothing to do with me. I'm as surprised as you. Hello, everybody. So it's Easter. What are we celebrating today? Easter, Easter. what does that mean? You get eggs, yeah. Candy. Chocolate. Anything else? Anything else that we're celebrating today? Exactly. So we just heard a scripture, and there were a few things, Sammy, there were a few things that were surprising about that scripture. What was one surprise? Anybody? Surprise? Women went to the tomb, and what were they going to do for to Jesus? What were they going to do? They were going to anoint his body, but what happened when they went there? What happened to the stone? So that was one surprise. The stone was rolled away. What was the second surprise? He wasn't there. Jesus wasn't there. What was the third surprise? There were two gleaming men standing there, and what did they say? Yep, so the first amazing thing was that big stone got rolled away. So a few years ago, I had this brilliant, brilliant idea that I would like to make a waterfall in my backyard. What are some things you need if you're going to make a waterfall? Water. Water. Like a pond. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A pump. Good. You guys are awesome. You could come build another one. Um, what else do you need? 
you need your brain and your body and you need and you need stones so here's a picture of my waterfall I'll pass it around so to me growing up on a farm it just seemed ridiculous that I would have to pay for stones <laughs> because a uh, ritual and I'm sure there's many people here today one of our rituals is picking stones so I wanted some really big ones, and I was lucky enough to have a friend who owns a gravel pit. So me and my family went out to this gravel pit with a very old pickup truck, and there were so many rocks, and we actually had a really good time, and it was a really bonding time for us to gather all these stones. However, I wanted some really big ones, and we were not very big people. So lo and behold, my friend, Janet, who I had no idea had this talent, hopped into this giant excavator and she started it up and there was a rumble and my son jumped in with her and she was able to maneuver that big machine over to big piles of rocks and we rolled them into the trough and then we dumped them into the, into the, um, the back of the pickup truck. So that was a very big surprise for me. I was probably not as surprising as the women that went to the tomb to see Jesus, but it was a big surprise and it was a reminder that we can all do hard things. Now, as a reminder of what we've been learning during Lent, what are some of the ordinary objects we've been talking about? Coats. Coats that was last week. What was the first week? It was something kind of... Shoes. shoes. We talked about shoes. If you, Dust. It was dust. And if you were here during kids' life, we dusted the pews. Remember that? Yeah. And... Yeah, oh, that's true. And then we talked about coins and bread and oil and coats and stones. So um, I'm going to uh, give you out the prayer cards. I'm not sure there's enough for everybody, but there probably is if you want to distribute them. And we'll say our prayer for this Lent together. Sam, can you take them and pass them along, please? So everybody that's able, can you read with me? Jesus, thank you for stones, a daily reminder that you can do all things. So before you scurry back, I have something that is not chocolate. But they are stones, and they have little sayings on them. And there should be enough for each of you. If there isn't, I have more. So during the week, when you are thinking about Easter... And our object for the week, you can hold these stones. And if you need help, can you pass them back? If you need help reading that, I'm sure um, your family members can help you. Okay, everybody. <laughs> Believe me, things didn't go as planned this morning. <laughs> okay, guys, come on, let's do it. Christ who left his home in glory, hymn number 361, let's stand in body or in spirit.
mind me, I'm just doing some reorganizing. Because I'm tall. Christ is risen. Well, my name's Ben, I'm one of the pastors here, and whether you are here in the sanctuary worshiping with us, whether you are worshiping with us online, whether that is right now at this very moment, or whether it is later this week, and whether you are here every week, or only once in a while, or you are a guest or a visitor, all are welcome here on this joyful Easter Sunday. Well, there is a conservation area somewhere in southern Ontario that I will not say where it is, just in case what I'm about to tell you was not against, was against the rules. But there is a stone, there is a conservation area somewhere in southern Ontario where there is a giant stone that bears the scars of my childhood hobby. When I was a boy, I collected fossils ancient and extinct creatures from millions of years ago whose bones, when they died, slowly turned to rock and became trapped themselves in larger rocks and stones. I still have a box of these childhood treasures tucked away in my basement at home. It was from my maternal grandfather that I acquired this hobby, and on one of his visits to Canada when I was a child, we were all out on a hike in the woods. And right beside the path, there was this huge boulder. Now, I mean, I was probably seven or eight, so, my, but in my mind, it is this giant thing. And smack dab right in the middle of it was a tiny little perfectly preserved fossil, maybe an inch or so big. And I got excited. It was a perfect specimen. And seeing my excitement, my grandfather said to me, which I can't do his accent, but, oh, do you want it? And I remember looking at him with confusion. I mean, yes, I wanted it, but it was stuck in this huge boulder. We can't move this thing. It's bigger than our car. There is no way I'm leaving with it. And I remember saying some, something to my grandpa, something like, Grandpa, it's impossible. To which he smiled a sly little smile. And next thing I knew, my grandpa, who was probably in his mid-70s at the time, finds a way to scramble up on top of this giant boulder and from the pocket of his tweed jacket extracts a small rock chisel and hammer. Because this is the kind of man who he was, who on an intercontinental trip makes sure not to leave home without his rock chisel and his hammer. And of course, where else do you store them but the inside pocket of a tweed jacket? Next thing I know, he's tapping away at this huge boulder. Tap, 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 tap. At first it seems as if nothing is happening. It's just my eccentric grandpa on a giant stone. But after a few minutes, he looks up at me and says, Ben, you might want to take a step back. So I do. He strikes the chisel once more, and all of a sudden, this impossible to move stone moves. A whole section of this giant boulder just slides right off and drops at my feet. And there, in the middle of it, is this fossil that I had wanted. Which, the piece was still too big, he managed to break it down more, and it came home and it became a treasured possession. But I will never forget that sense of this impossible to move stone, this giant immovable object moved. What seemed only to be nonsense was transformed and became reality. In our scripture reading from Luke 24 that we heard earlier in our service, we hear a similar sentiment to my own about the improbability of giant stones being moved. 
Jesus' disciples in verse 11, or it says this about Jesus' disciples in verse 11. But they did not believe the women because their words struck them as impossible nonsense. Impossible nonsense. This is the description of how Jesus' friends, cowering in fear because of his execution on Friday, reacted when a group of women reported to them that they had been to Jesus' tomb, that the stone had been rolled away, and that Jesus was no longer dead, but was actually alive. Impossible nonsense. Because, of course, it was. They had all been at Jesus' execution. They had all watched in horror the agonizing death of the one that they had loved, had followed for years, who they had left everything for and dedicated their lives to, who they believed was ushering in something new, something right, something good, something holy that the world desperately needed and was longing for. They had seen Jesus' body taken down from the cross, wrapped in a burial shroud, and laid in a tomb carved in a rock. And they had borne witness as a giant stone was manhandled across the entrance, sealing the tomb and the dead for all eternity. It was finished, complete, over and done. And ever since all this happened, those who had loved and followed Jesus, like the disciples Peter, James, and John, but many others too, have been hiding in fear, worried that they are next, that the same people who killed Jesus are going to do the same to them. But now on Sunday, here are a group of women saying that what they had watched and seen and borne witness to, what they had grieved and mourned, what had struck fear into their hearts and had crushed their hopes, what was of course final is not. Impossible nonsense. Of course it was impossible nonsense. How could it be anything else? How could any of these women, how could what any of these women are saying possibly be true? What were they even doing going to the tomb in the first place? Don't they know how dangerous it was? What if they'd been seen or discovered and that led the authorities back to everyone else? And what did they expect was going to happen when they got there? They'd all seen that stone over the entrance to the tomb. They all knew its finality. This is no field stone that just got put there haphazardly. This is a big made-to-purpose stone that would have taken three or four people to maneuver with the help of gravity on their side to get in place. And when it was situated just right, it fit in such a way that removing it would be near impossible. There are no points of leverage. Gravity is working against you, something certainly that these women could not have done on their own. What were they even doing taking spices to the tomb in the first place, knowing that the tomb was sealed, knowing there was this giant, immovable, too heavy to even budge barrier in their way? Impossible nonsense. The stone cannot be moved not to mention the rest of it. That after the impossible to move stone was somehow moved, that the body was missing, that suddenly two men in bright clothing appeared, and that through their fear, these women heard them speak impossible, nonsensical words. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Impossible nonsense. All of it. We can easily understand why these reports all seem to be impossible nonsense to those who first heard it from the lips of Mary and Joanna and Mary. Stones don't move. Angels don't speak. The dead don't rise. Impossible nonsense. And yet, 
It wasn't. And it isn't. Over the coming days and weeks, these women and these men would all meet the resurrected Lord. They will walk with Jesus and they will talk with Jesus. In the coming days, they will eat with Jesus and they will weep with Jesus. They will touch his side and hear his voice. They will return to the shoreline together and see him do the miraculous. And the very things they spent three years watching Jesus give and be to others, they will receive themselves acceptance, grace, forgiveness, mercy, love, welcome. And as they meet the risen Christ over the coming days and weeks, what was at first impossible nonsense turns to joy. Tangible, real world makes a difference in their lives and all those around them joy. It changes everything. It transforms the impossible. They themselves become transformed. They are transformed from a group cowering in fear, hiding because they are convinced that the same authorities who crucified Jesus will be coming for them next into people possessed with unexplainable boldness, who go out into the world telling others of Christ, of the risen Jesus, even to the point of accepting death themselves. Excuse me. These disciples are transformed. They are transformed from believing that the vision of Jesus for a new world that had been crushed on the cross of execution into believing not only that Jesus' new vision can still be hoped for, but that it is an actual reality now in their world and in their lives, and that they are called to join in. Not just that the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven is a nice ideal that we should aspire to, but that it is now and present and real. They are transformed from believing that Jesus and his message have been crushed, to knowing that Jesus has conquered the grave and is victorious. Where, O death, is thy sting? Meeting the resurrected Jesus changes everything for them. Experiencing as true what was what previously only seemed to be impossible nonsense causes them to become dedicated to, to work for, to believe in the possibility of other things, of other new realities that would also have seemed to be nothing but impossible nonsense in their day. Because Jesus is alive and the stone has been rolled away means other so-called impossible to move stones of the world become possible. For them at that time, in that era, it would have seemed to be impossible nonsense, to think, to dream, to declare, to believe, to live, things like the Jewish people and the Gentiles being equal before God and in community together. It would have been impossible to imagine that the message of one lowly itinerant Jewish preacher executed by the greatest power on earth could change the world and speak to all people. It would have been impossible to imagine that a community could exist that embraced and considered equal people of different economic status and social standings, especially in their world of rigid hierarchy. It would have been impossible to imagine that the message of this executed man could take on and conquer the power of Rome. That the way of peace was not just a fanciful dream. That the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor, the weak, the hungry, would become hallmarks of true faith. It would have been impossible to imagine that God's love is big enough for all and that any of it would someday be worth dying for. All of these things were the impossible, immovable stones of their time, obstacles that could not be overcome, realities that could just not only never change but never even be considered to be something that could change. And yet all these things, all these seem, things that seemed impossible and inconceivable were to become in just a few short years 
the very hallmarks of the early believers of the earliest churches to whom we are the inheritors. Because they encountered the living Jesus, what seemed at first to be itself impossible nonsense, protected by immovable stones, what meant all these other immovable stones could be moved as well. When an impossible nonsense becomes a reality, it empowers and emboldens us to believe the possibility of other nonsensical, immovable stones too. These men and women met the risen Christ. The impossible nonsense became a reality, and it changed the world. Today, the world needs people who believe in what seems to be impossible nonsense. Today, the world needs people who believe in the impossible nonsense of Easter, that the immovable stone was rolled away, and that Jesus is alive. Our world today has its own impossible to move stones, impossible to change realities that confine and condemn us all who dwell on this planet to live lives of suspicion and hate or destruction and selfishness, fear and othering, greed and the cult of more at the expense of those with little cycles and patterns that seem impossible to change. But the world needs people who, like these women and these men from long ago, have experienced the reality of the impossible to move stone rolled away, the, impossible of the, the impossibility of the risen Jesus, and who, because of this, work for and believe the possibility of other seemingly impossible nonsense, too. The world needs people who believe there is hope where it seems there is none to be found. The world needs people who believe that what seems impossible is not. The world needs people who believe that seemingly endless and intractable wars can end in peace and shalom. The world needs people who believe that ancient animosities need not be continued generation after generation. The world needs people who believe that the strong and the rich are not better than and who actively give away their position for the benefit of others. The world needs people who believe the earth is God's good creation and that there are ways for humanity to live and prosper while tending for it all. The world needs people who believe that reconciliation and justice between First Nations and settler without feeling personal threat is possible. The world needs people who believe those who say they have been hurt or abused by seemingly upright individuals. The world needs people who believe that there is enough for all, enough food, enough housing, enough money, enough health, enough space, enough respect, enough love. The world needs people who believe that all people carry the image of God and then act accordingly. The world needs people who believe that God's love is big enough for all, regardless of creed or language or nationality or sexuality or wealth or privilege, and we are all made in the image of a creator. The world needs people who believe that the stranger is not to be feared and instead of othering the stranger, that the stranger should be welcomed. The world needs people who believe that another world is possible. The world needs people who believe that Jesus' vision is a reality and that what he taught, he meant. The world needs people like you and I. All these things in our world today seem as impossible nonsense to, as, to many and they seem as if they are impossible to move stones in our world and in our lives. But the world needs people who believe in this nonsense because what once seemed as nonsense, that the stone cannot be moved and that Jesus cannot be alive, has become their reality. The world needs people who believe in the impossible nonsense of the resurrection 
who then with their very lives join in all these other impossible places to all these other places with the impossible to move stones and who give of their lives, their talent, their treasure, and their time to move them. Because Jesus is alive. Because at his tomb, the impossible to move stone was rolled away. And because of it, none of these other stones in our world are impossible to move either. And Easter calls us, invites us as people who know the resurrected Lord to join in moving these stones too. And yet it is not only our world that would seem to have impossible to move stones in it. It is in our lives as well. Conflict and estrangement, disease and illness, anxiety and fear, grief and despair, loneliness and hopelessness, destructive and harmful patterns of behavior, whether by self or by others, too little wealth or too much, addiction, shame, regret, self-loathing or self-doubt, and even death itself, are all just a few of the seeming impossible to move stones that we, that we face in our own lives. Stones that when we look at them seem permanent, immovable, and that trap us in cycles of hurt and of death. We all have such stones, every single one of us. And all of us, at one time or another, despair that they can ever be moved, that anything can ever be different, and that, that anything can ever be transformed. But Easter reminds us that impossible to move stones move. Because Jesus is alive, these stones in our own lives are not immovable. They are not impossible for God. No, things are impossible for God. New life, new realities, the impossible being transformed is the reality of our lives, and death is not the end. Where, O oh death, is thy sting? We worship a God who at Easter transformed the impossible who moved the stone, who raised Jesus from the grave, and now the stones of our lives, the deaths in our lives, are not permanent and are not final, whether in this life or the next. And God is able to transform and move the impossible stones in our lives so that there we will discover God's grace, mercy, care, and love for ourselves as well. May we be a people who, like the women who go to the tomb and the men who cowered in fear, who all in the end meet the resurrected Jesus and come to know that God is in the business of transforming the impossible to move stones. May we be like them. May we be a people who, because of the resurrected Jesus, because God does move the impossible stones, may we join our lives to the seemingly impossible situations of our world this day knowing that our God transforms the impossible. And for the places in our own lives, where our hurts and our fears, where they seem as if they are gravestones, sealing us in tombs of death, death, this Easter, may we all, may you, experience God's power and love, transforming and moving your impossible to move stones, so that you may know new life. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen and amen. Hey guys, I'm going to reread Luke 24, 1 to 11. So, very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, the women went to the tomb bringing fragrant spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled, rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they didn't find the body of Lord Jesus. They didn't know what to make of this. Suddenly, two men were standing beside them in gleaming bright clothing. 
The women were frightened and bowed their faces toward the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here. He has been raised. Remember what he told you while he was still in Galilee? That the human one must be handed over to the sinners, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. They remembered this. They remembered his words. When they returned to the tomb, they reported all these findings to the eleven and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other woman with them who told these things to the apostles. But they did not believe the woman because their words struck them as impossible nonsense. In response, let us sing together, Thine is the Glory, number 355. And let us rise, either in body or in spirit. Christ is risen. He is risen On this Sunday of Sundays, the high point of the Christian life, the resurrection and the defeat of death itself, we gather in worship celebrating the power of our God of love, that nothing in all creation can stand in God's way. And it is with the assurance of the majesty of God that we gather in worship and in prayer this morning. Are there life events, joys, or burdens, or updates that we'd like to share with the congregation and hold in prayer together? There's a mic at the back or here at the front as well. That is... oh.
Thank you. I'd just like to ask a prayer for one of our grandsons, Matthew. Um, he's 21 this year. And a year ago, yesterday, he, had, he was in a serious car accident. Um, it, if it weren't for the Lord standing between him, he would not be with us today. Uh, the surgeon made that clear. Um, he was T-boned by a, another car that went through a stop sign uh, just on Navsiga. And he had to be cut out of the car he doesn't remember much about it, and then he was airlifted to the trauma unit in uh, London. It took him a while, and it's been a whole year now, and he's still working through some difficulties. He has all kinds of stuff in the one leg. Um, he had a lot of breakage, and he's been so strong and so positive, even on his difficult days. He has a wonderful supportive uh, family and friends and uh, I know that the struggles are ongoing and I just would like to ask everyone if they could please remember Matthew and ask the Lord to continue to give him the courage that he's had and the strength to get through this. Thank you. Let's join together in prayer. Jesus, we celebrate that today you are risen. God of the Easter morning, we are in awe of you, of the wonder, the majesty, and the mystery of who you are, how you work, and your love that finds its way through all things, even death itself, transforming even the impossible. We offer our prayers this morning for the possible and the impossible. We pray for an end to violence around the world. May hope, resources, accountability, and generosity guide the way. We pray for broken and conflictual relationships. May reconciliation bring healing and restoration to complicated situations. We pray for those grieving alone and walking each day with a wounded heart. May your love offer peace, deep love, and rest to weary souls. We pray for all those living with health concerns and uncertainty. May joy find its way to worried minds and healing of body and hope for our souls be felt. We pray for Matthew and give thanks for life and healing this past year and pray for ongoing courage and strength as your spirit surrounds him. We pray for those facing difficulty, suffering, and darkness. May your light shine, O oh Lord, even just a glimmer, as an overwhelming reminder that we are never alone. You are always with us, now and always. We also offer our praise and gratitude for the small and big ways you move among us. Thank you for sunshine, for good sleep, for communities of support, for successful surgeries and medical treatments, for hope when things feel out of control. Thank you that your promises are just as true today as they were centuries ago. Thank you that your love is big enough to transform the world, tender enough to transform our hearts, and creative enough to transform even the impossible. Today we celebrate all that you can do for the impossible nonsense that you can change. For Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. There are many ways to share our financial offerings in the plates that are passed this morning, or you can do so electronically, and through the coin offerings, which the children will collect in a few moments. 
These coin offerings today will be given to MCC's response to the Gaza crisis. I invite the ushers forward now to receive the offering. Let us pray. God of extravagant mercy, with hands outstretched, you have poured out wonder and pleasure and delight, goodness and beauty and bounty. So take our offerings, we pray, as our protest against all that is evil and ugly and impoverished, trivial and wretched and tyrannical in our world and in ourselves that we too may be poured out for the world. Amen. Our bulletin includes many ways for involvement through the week. Perhaps someone has an additional announcement to make at this time. Blessed are the pie makers, for they shall make us full. <laughs> My name is Brandon Ginrick, and I have got one thing on my mind, and you guessed it, it's the flat roof. Uh, <laughs> this past week, the crew was back again. They are finishing off the, uh, no, it's the, uh, the crispy, crumbly topping. They're, they're putting that flat roof in the oven, and they're getting it just a perfect golden brown. The, the toppings are bubbling up, and the crust is just perfectly flaky. Of course, once they finish, this will trigger the final payment of our, uh, sorry, payment of our fees. I know, I've got one thing on my mind. Um, uh, as you know as well, though, we do have other uh, facility needs upcoming in the coming years, which we do need to raise funds for. Uh, next Sunday, as you know, is our PI GM, sorry, AGM. Um, on a side note, if anyone's driving back to Kitchener after, my wife's gonna make me walk home after all these jokes, so 
looking for a ride. Um, next Sunday is our AGM. And following the AGM, we're going to have a regular, normal potluck. Okay, so try to hold back your excitement. I know potlucks get you going. Um, but following the potluck is going to be a pie auction. That's the real exciting part. This pie auction is going to be kicking off our fundraising efforts. Um, we are still looking for a few people to make pies. Uh, if that's you and, you've, and if you'd like to sign up, there's a sheet in the lobby or you can speak to Janessa Otto uh, and we'll get those pies out there. If you're like me, more of an eater, you can start picking up some odd jobs this week, looking under the couch cushions, <laughs> selling that exercise bike you swore you were going to use on Marketplace, whatever you got to do, um, but come ready uh, to get some pies. Thank you very much. This uh, weekend is WO's musical of Emma, and the MYF pre-purchased 16 tickets for Friday night at 7, and we have a few left over. So if you are interested in joining the MYF uh, to go and watch Emma, speak to myself or Joanne, as she has the other tickets. Um, and also, if you are a pickleball lover, the junior youth are playing pickleball on Saturday this coming Saturday, three to five, um, and we could use a few more people to come and help teach pickleball. So if you're interested, feel free to come there too. Thanks. And I would like to express my gratitude for the beauty of music that the orchestra offered today and Norma, it's great to have you back. your glad voices in triumph on high, hymn number 340, and let us rise.
Well, before the benediction, I just want to highlight what is happening after. You'll see in your program and your bulletins that it says impromptu choir and the hymn all hail the power of Jesus name. Anyone, and I mean anyone who wishes, may come to the front up here and maybe over here and we'll figure out the spacing and form an impromptu choir. Yes, anyone. All voices and all singing abilities are welcome to come and be part of this choir. If I'm going to be in it, and if I'm in the choir, you can too. This is a fun and a joyful choir, not a per perfect or performance choir. Kids, you are welcome to come. When you were up here for children's time, you all discovered the instruments that I left in a poor place. This is when they're here for, so come grab an instrument, get an egg shaker or a tambourine or something, and make a joyful noise as we sing this hymn. Anyone is welcome, just bring a hymnal with you and we will end our service in this way. And now, here are these words of benediction. Jesus, thank you for stones, a daily reminder that you can do all things, that you can transform the impossible in our lives, in our communities, and in our world. May we leave this place this day in the joy of your Easter resurrection. Amen. And anyone who wishes, please come and be part of the choir. And if everyone comes, that's great too.